Good afternoon. It's 4 p.m. Sunday, KBC Channel 1. Welcome to Dada's. Thank you for watching us. We appreciate and honor each one of you for taking time every Sunday to watch us. Today we want to talk about endometriosis. It's a big word. You're right. It's a very big word. Endometriosis. Um, and I want to begin to unpack it with Veronica Gasheri. Veronica, may I call you Sherry? Yes, because that's what everybody calls you. Yes. You're aware that Sherry is a French word meaning something like lovely or my love? Yes. Okay, cool. I just, I just wanted to point that out. Mm -hmm. And you are indeed very lovely. <laughs> you are the assistant manager for Endometriosis Foundation. Yes. But I think you yourself have been through endometriosis, so you identify with the struggle. Mm -hmm. um, every woman, I, well, th this is me, dreads her menses. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I think so. When did you as kind of start? My period started when I was 12 years old. I was in class 8. But before that I had already started having stomach issues. And the doctor did a scan and they told me that uh, you're about to start your period. So probably that's why your stomach is acting up. So for me my pain started almost immediately after I got my first period. And when I went to high school, it became worse and worse up until when I was in Form 4, that it got too much because I could not go to class when I was on my period. I had to sleep in the dormitory for the first two days because I have a running stomach that uh, is not stopping. I am in pain. So sitting in class still is not possible. So concentrating even whatever the teacher is teaching, I, I, I was just like in space. So when I went to a doctor, they prescribed a uh, Femiplan. Uh, Femiplan is not a contraceptive? It is a contraceptive, but uh, how it works for endometriosis patients is it regulates the hormones. Okay. So you get some relief from it. But I was quite young. I was around 16. I started school early. So I was 16 in Form 4. And when I went with the medication to school, the matron took it. She was like, uh, why is a 16-year-old coming with uh, contraceptives to school? We have to wait for your mother to come and explain what is going on. Because we don't know if we are dealing with a case of someone who is trying to stop pregnancy or what is going on. So I had to wait. I'm in pain and I had to wait until parents' day. And my mom came and then they were called and they were, she explained that uh, this girl has painful periods. And the doctor suggested that this uh, family plan will help. That is when the matron handed me my medication and I was able to start on them. And then after high school, I sort of just went on with the pain. Whenever I'm in pain, I could miss classes in campus. And then I go back and I get notes from my friends. But then it got to a point where now I got employed and I started asking for days off every time I'm just calling in sick. So when I went, first I was not even diagnosed with endometriosis. I was told I have polycystic ovarian syndrome. They explained to me like my ovaries are filled with water. And uh, they told me it's hormonal. So the doctor was like, uh, we need to check other things, uh, diabetes and all this so that we know you're okay. So they did a random test and they found my sugar levels were fine. And then they told me now they started their pressure, you need to start having children. And my queue, I was 23 years old, no boyfriend, uh, no, no plans of starting a family. So the pressure was on. It got to a point I decided, no, let me change my gynecologist because this guy is focusing on me starting a family and not getting any relief. So I found a doctor. Did you, you, you did explain that this happens when you're having your periods. Yes. I told him that I have a running stomach. I could even sit up the toilet for over five hours, seated, just passing, passing. My running stomach is just not settling. And then I started developing other symptoms. I started vomiting. I could have sweat. I could break out into sweat when I'm on my period. Walking became an issue. Sometimes um, I could even soil myself because the blood is too much. So I went to another doctor and I explained my symptoms and he looked at me and I said, I think you have endometriosis. What we'll do is schedule a laparoscopic surgery. We go inside and we see what's going on. So they did that. They scheduled a surgery. They went in and they found endometriosis. So this leads me to my next point. What is endometriosis? 
Endometriosis is a painful condition whereby the tissue that lines your uterus grows outside it. So it can grow in your ovaries, it can grow in your fallopian tubes, it can grow literally anywhere in your body, but the main areas it is found in the woman is the reproductive system. But there are some rare cases where it has been found in other organs like the lungs and the intestines and the stomach walls. Oh my God. Yes. Okay. So this is a real condition. Yes. Could it be also that we were all taught that our periods were meant to be painful? And therefore, when the minute you say you're having a painful period, everybody looks at you like you're just trying to be special. Do that you actually is the stigmatization we face. And that is why the Endometriosis Foundation of Kenya, we, we want to end that stigmatization. Because when you tell someone period pain is normal, and this person cannot take a simple painkiller and get relief, this person has to go to a doctor sometimes and get intravenous um, assistance. Yeah. Yes, you get medication that can relieve the pain. So that is not normal. Normal pain, I'll take my brufen and I'm good to go. But for endometriosis, it doesn't work like that. And you also have to look at uh, other aspects of your life, your lifestyle, mm -hmm. your diet. You have to watch what you eat. You have to watch your stress levels. And it's, it's sad that people tell women that period pain is normal. It's not normal. It's, it's, it needs to end because uh, we had a case recently of a girl who took her own life. Yes. We saw it on social yes. media and the media at large. And it is because um, women have been made to believe that pain is something you endure. Pain is, uh, and when you endure it, you prove that you're a you woman. You're a woman. Yes. You're a strong woman. Exactly. If you can endure pain. Yes. I've also had that uh, in my small research with endometriosis, I learned that the, the sometimes it's long. The, the, the time that the, the periods take are much longer than the normal, mm -hmm. but also that they can be erratic. They can kind of show up when they are not supposed to show up. Ha, was that, were any of that your experience? Yes, I used to get periods every, I used to get twice a month. Every two weeks I'm on my period, which made me anemic. <sighs> I could faint in town sometimes because uh, I, when I went for my blood and they saw it's at nine and they were like, this, this is low, so they put me on some drugs to rebuild my iron and to just give me the sense of normalcy. So it's erratic because I guess it's hormonal and uh, if your hormones are not stabilized, then you won't receive your periods like a normal person. Okay. Yeah. Okay, <coughs> so how rampant is this, is this endometriosis? Because now that you are, you, you're part of a foundation, are there, is there research? Or is it just Muzungu research? Do we know in Africa what kind of numbers we have? Uh, you know, or is it, because let me explain the thing about this. These are some of the things that people say. Those are niche diseases. Mm -hmm. eh? They are just for people who have food, shelter, clothing. Other women, uh, Mama Mboga does not need to know about endometriosis. She'll just soldier on. Yeah, she'll soldier on. So I how rampant is, is this a real disease? It is a real disease. The <coughs> statistics show that it's one in ten women. So if you know ten women, one one in ten women have it, and um, it's it's because, like you've said, we've been made to think this is normal. So not many will go to hospital up until the point where now they are not able to function, and they are not able. Maybe when they get married, they find difficulty in conceiving, and so that is when women will now start going to hospital. But with the awareness that we're doing. We are seeing many people coming to us. They send us messages and tell us, I have been having this and I need to see a doctor and I need to know what is going on. And it's good because now pe people are getting to know that uh, one, you should not just be in pain constantly because for me, I knew this is the norm. And whenever I was on my periods, I would lock myself in the bedroom, wait for my four days or five days to pass and then I resurfaced and people were like, where have you been all this time? If you had periods two, two times a month, that meant half your month was gone. Yes, and you constantly look at your calendar. You constantly, if today is the third, you count 14 days, you know, by the 17th, I need to be out of town and just within the comfort of my house. And you don't live like a normal human being because you could even be invited to an event. You have to cancel. If you have exams, you have to think ahead. You have to go and see your lecturer and tell them, 
I may not be able to make it. But what, what about when you get a job, like a job? What happened? Now that is the issue because for me, in my case, in 2015, I lost my job because I was so sick. I, I, I think I took a long time at home, like a month, recuperating. And uh, when I came back, I felt a bit better because I was on the hormonal treatment. But then after going off, the symptoms came back, the pain came back, and I started calling in. I'm sick, I'm sick, and my boss was like, uh, yes, you perform well. Yes, you're a good employee. But you're not there. But you're not there. So For so many days exactly. in a month. And it's bringing issues because maybe my colleagues are asking, why? Why is she never there? So yeah, he had to let me go. Is this something you can explain to... I, I think, uh, let, me exp let me explain and then ask the question. Is it your reality that it's very hard to explain to people where you are sick? Because if a normal person, a normal lady, you have this, you know, you have acne and you have a bad mood and you have, you know, and people sort of think she must be, yeah? But is it hard to explain to people that I cannot come for four days to work uh, because I have my periods? Does it sound as... As I say it now, it sounds quite ridiculous. Is that how one of the reasons why this is such a hard thing to explain to people? When I got my diagnosis, now my boss asked me what is actually going on because I just used to tell him I'm sick. I never used to tell him I have a backache or surgery. What? So when I finally got the diagnosis and I told him yes, I have this condition called endometriosis, and he was like, endo what? And then now I started explaining that I have painful periods, <gasps> and he was like, "That is so. That first of all, that is so embarrassing. Exactly. You know, like you are, you, 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 at least you are fair. You could literally blush. You know, for me, I don't even know. I'd <laughs> say that you'd be like, I have painful days. Yes, I think for me it had gotten to a point like I was, I was in a lot of um, anguish because I liked, I loved my job." But I could not be there because when you wake up, first of all, you haven't slept the whole night. You've been in the toilet. And then you get maybe two to three hours of sleep. And then, you know, with a running stomach, you are so dehydrated and fatigued. And then you wake up, you want to prepare for work, but you're like, you get to work first. You, you're the last to ever come in because you get to work after everyone. Like at 10, 11 is when you're showing up. And when you're there, you're not performing at 100%. Because you're just constantly thinking, have I soiled myself? Uh, when will my stomach start again acting up? And then I'm in, stuck in the toilet, and then it's, it's public toilet. So when I told my boss that I, was, I had reached the end of the rope, like, you need to know what is going on. Let me just come up. And, and the sad part is he told me, that one you just swallow Panadol and you're fine. And I look at him like, Panadol, Panadol. You have no idea. Panadol cannot help me in any way. That will just be like taking a sip of water. But then I was like, um, let me not struggle too much because I'm the one who knows what I'm feeling. So I asked him for leeway. And he was gracious. I have to admit my, my employer at the time was gracious. But I guess uh, with office politics and you know you have to answer the reports and everything, it had to get to a point where now he was like, uh, we have to let you go. Okay. Is there relief? Is there, is there like, is there treatment, first of all, for this thing? The gold standard for treatment for endometriosis is excision surgery, whereby they go inside and they remove, remove the growths wherever they are from the root. Uh, as of now, I think it's starting to be introduced in Kenya. I'm not sure whether it's fully here, but uh, last I, I checked, it was not available in the country locally. You have to go abroad uh, to places like Romania, the US, the UK to get uh, the, the gold standard treatment. So what happens here is you're given uh, hormonal replacement, various drugs you're given to help with the condition. Uh, they give you a period, uh, for my case was you take for three months and then you get your period f for the fourth month and then you start on it again. So that at least for those three months you're not just in pain full time. Okay, so they stop your period? Yes. And then you have it for a month and then they stop it again? Yes. If you get into a marriage, how does that even pan out? 
Uh, what I did for my case, um, when I was diagnosed, I told my boyfriend, who was seeing at the time, and I told him of the um, possibilities, because endometriosis does come with its possibilities. Number one, there is painful sex. You feel pain when during intercourse. Number two, you, there is an off chance you might be infertile. Eh, you are delivering these facts, these big facts <laughs> with such cold cruelty i'm even afraid <laughs> you just delivered a very big fact painful sex you yes. just delivered it like that there'll be so you told him sit here mr so and so yes there will be painful sex face jaw drops first then of all one. i told him why don't you google mm. google read and then we talk because i was like i don't even know where to start um, this is someone who has proposed he wants to marry you. So you are engaged yes, to be married? exactly. And then I'm diagnosed with this condition and then I'm like, I went on Google and the doctor had explained everything. And he was so I told him Google and if you have questions, we talk. So he came back and he was like, so yeah, I've seen it and I'm comfortable. I've, I know the repercussions, should there be any? of painful sex, I have understood the repercussions of that you might not be able to conceive. But then again, it's not a hundred percent that you won't conceive. This is something that uh, a doctor evaluates, an endometriosis specialist evaluates with you when you are ready to have kids. They will tell you which methods are best. What can you do if it's IVF? If you have to do in IVF, you do it and you, you conceive. You are talking about, do you know how expensive those procedures are? <laughs> yes, I do. Okay. Yes. You are dropping these things like, you know, with cold. IVF is not something you just drop like that. It's not a joke. It's not a joke, but I guess you resign yourself to where you are at life. And uh, you have to look at the broader picture. You can't just look at the small picture like, no, I can't conceive and... You're there p pitying yourself. No, you have to look. I have options. I can do IVF. I can adopt kids. I can, uh, yes, there are options. Wow. So did this brave man mar marry you? Yes, we got married in 2017. Okay. And we're still together. Okay. So you have not yet gotten to considering children. Or are you considering children now? I think we are about to start uh, considering children, okay. yes. So while other couples will say, you know, let, we want to have a child, you have various options mm. which are not, f for lack of a better word, are not the normal. Yes. Okay. They're not the conventional. They're not the conventional, mm. the conventional way. How, how, d how do you feel about this? And I know you have this, you have this wonderful game face, but how do you really feel about this? I, I, when I was diagnosed, first of all, it was like, I knew something was wrong because I've always had these crazy periods and when the doctor told me this is it, I was like, finally. So it's a bittersweet moment because everyone has been telling you it's in your head and you can ignore it. But this is actually something that is, is a condition and I've not been faking my symptoms. So it's a bittersweet moment in that you finally know what is going on. But then there are these negative uh, aspects to it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's sort of bittersweet. Mm. Okay. When you meet women who come to the foundation, what, what are the first steps that you, you would tell them? They, they write to you and they say, I really am thinking I have it. What do you normally tell them to do? Our main, we start by knowing your symptoms. We start by asking you, what are you going through? And then from there, we refer you to the specialists we know, the ones we know that will listen because getting a doctor who listens to you is crucial not just someone who will throw in your face at, at 23 you get pregnant and why are you waiting and he was really persistent so we don't want the repeat of the same so we'll send you to specialists who first of all understand the condition very well secondly they listen to you and they take their time and they don't rush into surgery because also surgery has its downside. Ev ev ever being poked inside there is not always a good thing. So doctors will look at you and evaluate you from their experience and knowledge and will give you the, the hope and 
pain relief you need. You are just talking about this like as if you, they declare your death sentence, mm -hmm. but uh, in a nice way. They, they kind of tell you, oh, oh, I'm so sorry, Sherry. Your life has come to an end, but they know how to package it properly. Endometriosis is not a death sentence. It's, it's, you just, it's like being told you have a chronic condition uh, and you you now have to take medication to manage it. You'll now have to know what works for you because like I said, you watch your diet. There's some people when they eat bread, it flares up and you're in amou amounts of pain that you can't even understand. You watch what you, junk food, uh, burgers, fries, all those things, they really affect us at the end Th of the day. They affect the, your hormones, mm. the, the production of your hormones. Yes. Isn't it? Okay. So okay. you just basically adopt a new way of thinking. And it's not that you walk around saying, oh, I have endometriosis. Oh, I don't know. You just, uh, you have to go through counseling. And with your doctor, the help of your gynecologist, he or she will be able to bring you to a place where you're now on medication, you can function. If need be, you can get a letter from him or her to explain your condition to employers so that if you need to miss work, they know why you need to miss work. Sherry, you told me about um, that what you're trying to do at your foundation is do a lot of advocacy now, especially because of the, um, to get people to understand what we're dealing with and therefore to not be punitive for example, at the workplace. Mm -hmm. I think people losing their jobs is a big deal. Having a job in Kenya is a matter of life and death. Yes. So when you lose your job, it's a big deal. Um, what can you do to save women from losing their jobs? Because that's really a very big one. What we want to do is lobby government and uh, because it is only them who can help us to come up with work policies that ensure women don't lose their jobs because of this condition because endometriosis uh, patients and warriors they want to thrive in the workplace it's just that they are not able to at that time and it is not their fault so they should not be reprimanded for it so through lobbying the government and meeting with them we hope to come up with something that will give women protection like uh, we have leave days, you get your 30 days in a year. Mm. So we are hoping to come to a point where women can have at least, if it's three days off, so that they are able to just focus on getting through that part and then coming back to work with a mindset to continue working. Okay, so it's like getting sick days off, yes. like three real sick days. But you see, for sick days, when I used to take them, it came to a point they were over. Yeah. So you can't ask for any more because you finished. Yeah. yeah. So we want it to be law that these leave days mm. are theirs mm. and they should not be reprimanded and it's not part of your sick days. Okay. Yes. So more sick days. We had also said something about getting better medical, you know, like the medicines are really expensive, mm -hmm. the procedures are very expensive. Yes. Is endometriosis covered by NHIF, by the way? I know surgery is covered. There are some surgeries that are covered under NHIF, so the doctor will fill a form and you'll take it to NHIF and uh, they'll cover an amount of everything. So it depends on the amount. Um, um, for my, I've known many women who have received cover from NHIF to be able to receive surgery. Okay, mm. that's good. Mm. Okay, we're going to a break. Okay. We'll be joined by a doctor, a gynecologist, yes. um, who will give us a scientific perspective. Yes. We've heard about the anguish. Now we'd like to, to find out some signs and some solutions. Mm. Okay, so dadas, grab yourself a cup of tea, cocoa. We'll be right back. We are back. We are talking about endometriosis. As I had said, it's a big word, uh, which I'm beginning to learn is a very is not a very nice word if it's ever diagnosed. But it's quite a big word. Um, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Sherry. You've been very, very kind to share your story with us. Welcome, Dr. Charles Muteshi. Muteshi. Yes, it is. Dr. Charles Muteshi. You are a gynecologist, and I think you have other big titles. Could you introduce yourself, please? 
Uh, it's just my small head doesn't uh, <laughs> fit many caps on it. So, <laughs> but I'm a, a gynecologist um, and uh, endometriosis and fertility uh, specialist. Oh, cool. Okay. Now we were told what um, Sherry told us. Uh, Sherry told us what endometriosis is. Um, I wanted to ask you, what are the symptoms? Some of the clinical symptoms or some of the indicators for ladies who are somewhere at home who can say. I, that sounds like me. What are some of them? So, I think as she has explained already, endometriosis basically means um, the lining of uh, the womb, uh, cells similar to those would be found outside uh, that lining. And these cells will behave exactly in a similar manner to what happens to the womb lining cells as uh, it goes through cyclic changes in the month. I think we know the function of the womb is to carry a baby, but uh, women are privileged that uh, they can control that and uh, they are not pregnant all the time. So when you're not pregnant, the womb lining goes through phases of uh, building up and breaking down. Mm -hmm. Now, some women will have completely normal cycles and this happens every month, uh, whereas some other women would find that uh, there is a change in the pattern of uh, their cyclic behavior of the womb lining. Either you have uh, irregular periods, very heavy uh, flow, and sometimes a very painful periods. Now, where there is pain, we may find that um, it is due to these cells which are lodged outside the womb lining. Mm. So they go through the same pattern of behavior as what would happen in the womb lining and uh, the cells kind of build up and then they go that phase of breaking down but they don't bleed because they're outside the womb lining so that uh, inflammation that results from that breakdown can cause pain okay. so pain is a predominant symptom of endometriosis and um, it can be predictable in the sense that uh, a woman with regular periods could tell when they're pain is imminent and when it's likely to happen because they can uh, predict the onset of their period. Okay. And sometimes over time, this pain goes on to change its character. So whereas we say it's cyclic, meaning that it comes with the periods, it may also uh, happen in mid-cycle. It could also be continuous. So Depending it just continues on the whole month? Some women will have continuous pain. Wow. that is unrelenting and only made worse when their periods appear. We also find, depending on where the endometriosis cells are sat, uh, they could be on the bowel, so you might have uh, pain when you open bowels. There could be endometriosis on your bladder, so there might be pain when you go to the toilet. And there could be endometriosis also in the tissues uh, between uh, the vagina and the rectum, and this can account for pain uh, during uh, activities like sexual intercourse or even just simple use of a tampon. Now, endometriosis is not restricted to pelvis alone. Uh, very, very few cases are described in uh, distant organs like the lungs. So women may have um, uh, cyclic or uh, regular uh, collapse of their lungs or pain in their chest every time they have a period. And very rarely it could also be in places like the brain where you have a seizure uh, that comes every time you have a period. So it's quite a complicated condition that um, is not quite easy to just describe in such terms. Doctor, you, you know, the two of you are, are just describing this thing that is horrific. In such scientific language and clinical language, it's very frightening. You are nodding about pain seizures. And you said one in every 10 women has endometriosis. So this is an old disease. Why are we only hearing about it now? Uh, there has been a bit of secrecy al around uh, um, reproductive themes uh, over time. And it's only in the last uh, 40 to 50 years that um, uh, it's become open to even talk about uh, female reproductive uh, uh, function and activity. So we know women for a long time suffered with endometriosis. And uh, because it was a taboo to discuss it, uh, it wasn't discussed. So it's not a new disease. 
uh, but we have had um, uh, brave soldiers who have come out to break that silence and uh, doctors taking time to understand it more and with the advent of um, uh, technologies such as ultrasound which came in the, uh, uh, in the early to late 60s and laparoscopic surgery uh, in the 1970s we are now, now able to characterize it more and understand it a bit more. So it's an old disease that we just couldn't diagnose. Absolutely. And uh, the symptoms mimic other conditions. So uh, pain in the pelvis uh, was commonly confused with uh, 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 pelvic infection. And a lot of girls will uh, have tons and tons of antibiotics uh, without getting relief from this. OK. OK. Um, Gasheri. Uh, when you think about the fact that this is a very old disease, you were telling me that your mom had it, mm -hmm. your sister, your mom lived through it. Mm -hmm. And uh, she kind of said, what, what did she tell you that, you know, when you told her you had endometriosis and she was like, I also had it. What did she say about this? She didn't know she had endometriosis. What she had been told by her doctors was it's dysmenorrhea. You have dysmenorrhea. That was a term that was used to describe painful periods before now we came to know it is endometriosis. So she told me that I had painful periods and I used to... If it gets too bad, she would get a few hours, not the whole day, a few hours off of work. But for her and her generation, pain was something you endure. It's something that proves you're a woman and you're a woman enough. Dr. Um, can this thing be treated? I know that Kashari has told me there are some treatments and you can go to, where was it? We were going to Romania or? You can go abroad. Abroad, UK, Romania, UK. Yes. But, you know, not really. It's, it's sort of you manage it. Why is there no treatment? Um, the management of endometriosis is very personalized mm. and uh, it also depends on the symptoms that it presents. Now, incidentally, we know women would have endometriosis and some of them do not have symptoms at all. Mm. So you might discover when you're doing a procedure such as uh, sterilization or tubal ligation and you find presence of endometriosis. So it's completely asymptomatic in some women. Um, where are the uh, symptoms and it depends on which symptoms and at what age uh, these symptoms uh, manifest then uh, the approach will depend on uh, what bothers uh, the girl the most. Mm. Mm. Uh, a very honest discussion with the doctor of uh, what is um, uh, feasible and uh, what may not be feasible. And uh, running through the tri treatment options, understanding how they work. Uh, not all, w all women with endometriosis will respond exactly the same to uh, similar uh, medication. So, so, so it's not one size fits all. Absolutely. It's, it's a very personalized disease. Indeed. Wow, okay. So it's almost boutique treatment. This, this one, her own treatment. This other person, her own treatment. Isn't that very expensive? Uh, you could say bespoke, but... Um, uh, yeah, bespoke. In, 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 in other words, understanding that um, these are cells which are very similar to the womb lining cells and uh, they don't go away uh, easily so some of the uh, manifestations for example pain that comes cyclically uh, can either be managed uh, with the understanding that uh, if you took hormone suppression for example uh, and that can come with the other advantage that it can be used in uh, sexually active uh, girls and women for contraception so that can be taken for a, um, a long period of time. Now the challenge comes in when you have to change your life goals. For example, you are considering uh, getting uh, a baby and then you have to come off these pills. The pain might come back. So you have to then kind of look at your other options and consider uh, treatment such as uh, surgery. Now, not all girls or women will also respond to the hormones. And there are also different types of hormone preparations which come with uh, various side effects. So you kind of try and say, I think I would try this, and if it doesn't agree with me, I could try that. And uh, if that still doesn't agree with me, then uh, we would want to consider uh, a surgical option. Now, it's very important and key before surgery is um, uh, considered to try and establish whether you could make 
a diagnosis of the extent of the disease before going to theater. Mm. Because um, um, it, is, it is good to make a diagnosis laparoscopically, uh, but it's best that if you're suspecting endometriosis, then uh, a laparoscopic diagnosis is accompanied by definitive treatment in the same setting. Now, there will be cases where you may uh, find that you run into uh, a diagnosis of very severe endometriosis because, again, it's graded into various stages and that poses complexity to the operating surgeon. So wow. if you're not capable of uh, managing the severe forms, then there is nothing wrong with saying, we found this stage of endometriosis, uh, but I'm limited by my ability to uh, remove the lesions and I will refer you appropriately uh, to the right surgeon. Okay. Normally, when it comes to having children, you know how we want to be mothers? Uh, we do, we really do want to be mothers. How bad is it if you are diagnosed with endometriosis? What are your chances of ever being a mom? Overall, we think that there might be a slight reduction in the uh, chance to conceive uh, okay. per fertile ma uh, month. Uh, in the long run, perhaps that evens out. And uh, the advice we would uh, give to anybody trying for pregnancy is um, you don't have to panic. Uh, try first and see if you didn't succeed, then we can look at options. Because we also know couples who are struggling but they don't have a definite diagnosis of mm. subfertility. Mm. So having a label of endometriosis should not automatically mean that uh, you are going to uh, be subfertile. But of course, this has to be qualified because we know very severe forms of endometriosis that uh, cause scarring of the pelvis and uh, damaging tubes. Uh, it means in those cases, your chance of conceiving naturally mm. uh, diminishes. There is surgery that we can try and uh, excise the lesions, free up the ovaries and the tubes, and maybe give you a few months to try. And if it didn't work, then uh, we are also there to help with uh, other technologies uh, around conception. Asheri, you know the doctor is too, is too nice to say. How much do all these things cost? They sound expensive. Um, my laparoscopy surgery was around 350,000 mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, there are some which go even higher. I've heard of cases where they reached 900,000. But like I said, NHF does cover a portion. Like, the doctor will fill a form and they'll cover depending on how they see fit to give you, to allocate mm -hmm. you money. Okay. Isn't it true that many women will never really seek redress just because they can't possibly afford even to see a gynecologist? Access to care is a reality and um, uh, I think it, it boils down again to uh, a functional health system uh, because if um, you have to see your GP who could refer you to a proper specialist mm -hmm. but in the first instance you do not have that access then it's quite limiting. Uh, we know there are studies that have been published in this country most people um, would get that access to care by paying out of pocket. Uh, I'm aware that less than 10% of Kenyans have uh, uh, insurance uh, of any nature, uh, including NHIF. So it is, um, it's not a good diagnosis, this endometriosis, isn't it? Not as miserable as the <laughs> word sounds, it's a mouthful. <laughs> and. Um, uh, you, you shouldn't really think that um, uh, it's only the surgery that uh, would, uh, uh, would, would, would be the only option, uh, but we know that uh, it does have great benefits when it comes to things like uh, quality of life. Mm. And even in the best circumstances, uh, depending on the extent of disease and also the underlying mechanisms on things like pain, you may find surgery uh, relieves symptoms in 60 to 80 percent mm. and uh, in those who do not find relief in uh, surgical excision uh, then you have to look at other options and the the, the reality of uh, uh, a successful surgery also has to depend on the extent so if endometriosis is going to the extent of um, attaching itself on your nerves on the bowel on the ureter then there must be a very clear balance uh, going ahead with an operation, knowing that if I'm going to remove 
a disease like endometriosis on your nerve and cut your nerve, that could mean you're paralyzed. So what would then be the option in that sense? So can I use a, a hormonal suppression to manage your symptoms with the understanding that um, uh, it may not be optimal, but uh, maybe uh, the lesser evil? What if I never do anything? What if nothing ever? I mean, I, I, I have these painful periods, and the truth of the matter is, you know, periods do end, don't they? They do end at 50 something. So what if I never do anything? So, my discussion with uh, my patients uh, usually would be you come in with particular symptoms, and we know you possibly have endometriosis. And uh, what I say to you would be um, please list to me the three priority areas uh, that this condition bothers you the most and what you think you want to address. And it's not surprising that um, uh, something like fatigue uh, is number one on the list, mm. uh, followed by pain. So whereas the presentation is, is pain, uh, it does cause other symptoms that uh, come with the disease. So oh, I see. Uh, okay. someone who is uh, uh, worrying and in chronic pain uh, would develop sleeplessness and they are actually fatigued and not able to function even when they are not in pain. So they, you look at the priority symptoms and those are the ones you, you will um, uh, address, including, um, you know, when you discuss surgery, uh, I have to say, what are other options, including doing nothing, and what does that mean to you? Okay, so doing nothing is a real option. It is. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shari. Doing nothing is a real option, Dr. Shari. Um, I think I'll take some final thoughts. Um, my, 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 word, my, what, what would be your, like your final thoughts concerning this matter before I end with the, with the good doctor? Uh, my words would be, one, we should end the stigmatization about periods. It should stop being a taboo. A woman should be able to talk about this and it should not be taken as though it's, a, it's, it's disgusting or anything. And two, that um, endometriosis is not the end. You, you can live a good life and you, you can manage it. And you should also seek medical treatment. Um, I wouldn't agree that um, doing nothing do is an option. I had actually thought of it. just do nothing. Like, mm. the, like the old mamas, you do nothing. Yeah, it, it, it's not an option because you live a life where you just constantly counting days in the calendar. Mm. So doing nothing is not an option. Please okay. come to us, the Endometriosis Foundation of Kenya. We have a support group on Facebook. We are on Telegram. There are various, many women with this condition and we support each other because support with a chronic condition is very critical mm -hmm. because you can sit at home and tell yourself, I'm the only one. And then you start having funny thoughts, which is not good. You can thrive in, uh, with endometriosis, with, uh, with good uh, medical treatment, you can thrive. Okay. So you can thrive? Yes. Okay. I've never left a show doctor feeling so disillusioned. Um, because I think for me the disillusionment is this, is, this is such new information to many women. But such grave new information. Um, in the sense that I was even reading up, uh, endometriosis is, is, is associated with things like pelvic cancer, is associated with a few other things that are a bit frightening. And yet this is new information. Many women have seen the name, but they actually don't know what we're talking about. How can we get this information out faster? Um, I think advocacy, but before I say that, um, uh, just to kind of clarify, uh, I think we, when we Are say... Are you giving us hope now? Uh, a lot of hope. Yes. Uh, <laughs> one is um, um, the do nothing bit was not to sit home and say, I'm mm. hopeless here. Mm. It's saying, I've been given all these options. I think this fits me, or uh, I might want to try that, yeah. or I might want to even take some time to think through before I make an uh, is it a Is it a big emergency if you are diagnosed with endometriosis? Is it, is it the kind of thing that we rush you to theater? Or can you go home and consider? I, I don't know. This is a real question. I actually don't know. Is this? It's, it's got to be considered very carefully and obviously where you are uh, having uh, your treatment. 
uh, needs to set very clear goals. So uh, it's, it's, it's true you don't need to rush to surgery, mm. but um, uh, pain when it's there is quite uh, excruciating uh, and probably debilitating. So you want that addressed. Um, I, I think uh, your earlier question about um, uh, you know being disillusioned. Yeah, a uh, bit disillusioned. Yeah, it, it shouldn't come out that way because one, uh, I think I'm glad people are now able to talk about uh, endometriosis and a hidden subject because a lot of uh, girls, it, it starts quite early and uh, it's not uncommon that uh, uh, many women are diagnosed with endometriosis in their late 20s and early uh, 30s or some are not ever diagnosed at all. So, but symptoms are known to start quite early. So going out and educating uh, the girls particularly and uh, everyone else about endometriosis uh, is, is, is quite key. And it is manageable. Uh, we, we know several personalities who talk about their experiences with their endometriosis and you will never have known about that uh, unless they spoke. Mm. Uh, in terms of its relationship with cancer, and um, uh, I think cancer is, uh, is, is, is usually quite um, uh, uh, a nerve-wracking word once it's mm. mentioned. Mm. Uh, the relationship is not as direct as uh, you would want to imagine, and uh, it's not related to cervical cancer. Okay. So cervical cancer predominantly is caused by HPV infection, uh, which is completely different. And what is hip, hip, now we are about to go into a completely different thing, but because you dropped it, what is that? Uh, HPV is a form of um, a viral infection. Uh, it's called human papilloma virus, uh, and it's sexually transmitted. Uh, and it specifically affects uh, cervical cancer, but it can also affect other cells. Um, endometriosis, on the other hand, um, is especially in women who have had what we call ovarian endometrioma, which is a cyst on the ovary, uh, it may coexist or may predispose to a, a very rare form of uh, cancer of the ovary, uh, which um, uh, if you, you know you've got endometriosis, then especially in, in women in their late 40s when they've got cysts on the ovary, we have to be very, very careful uh, looking at them and uh, considering perhaps removing them because uh, that association is there. This does not mean we have to go into panic mode because um, overall when you look at uh, cancers of the ovary, the predominant types are not associated with endometriosis. Secondly, they will be mainly in women in their uh, menopausal age bracket. So when we see a cyst in a younger girl, then we may want to say, you know, it is not causing symptoms, uh, uh, but because we think it is endometriosis, perhaps you may want to consider having that cyst removed uh, because of that risk. This is too much information for one show. I, I, I really, I really want to bring this to a close. Um, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Dr. Tari. Please keep talking about endometriosis. Keep talking about it because I assure you, many people don't know what we are talking about. Um, and it, it is extremely serious. I am gravely shocked at what I have learned. And this is extremely serious. And we have to just, I think we have to keep talking about it and keep telling women it's important. Is checkups check important? Are you going to talk about pap smears and things like that? It's always part of uh, a comprehensive uh, uh, review. There would be no point coming to clinic for me to just listen to you know one part of your symptom. It's more like if you have your car go into the garage and mm. uh, the headlamp is not functional, then uh, the mechanic would just fix the headlamp and send you away. They kind of make sure that you've got mm. a healthy car going home. Mm. So we would usually want to go to, through a comprehensive uh, health history and if there's anything else we pick out, then we, we, we would want to advise you accordingly. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dadas. Um, <laughs> it, it was a big word. I did say it was a very big word, endometriosis, and you've heard all about it, or just a little about it. But I think, again, for me, it's, it's so important for us to do our checkups. Go and get your pap smear every year. Visit your gynecologist. Um, and if you have painful, uh, clinical symptoms of endometriosis, see a gynecologist. It may be a little bit expensive, but it is so important for you to get these things done. Uh, have a good week um, and be safe.
um, and just, just take care of yourselves. Baraka. <laughs>